Hello, and welcome to iRacing. iRacing is the most advanced and comprehensive racing simulation software in the world. It's also the most realistic. Since its launch, iRacing has become a legitimate training tool for aspiring and professional race car drivers around the world. The iRacing Driving School is a series of training videos we've developed for our drivers. They teach specific racing techniques to help improve driving skill and ultimately to achieve faster times. These techniques are the same basic concepts taught to many of the most successful professional drivers in the world. The iRacing Driving School covers the following basic concepts of racing vehicle dynamics. Fundamentals of the racing line and cornering, using your eyes, braking, downshifting, racecraft, racing techniques and rules of the road, pre-race practice, qualifying and time trials, and race starts. As you go through the iRacing Driving School, be sure to practice what you've learned within the sim, both in single car test sessions and in single player AI races against computer opponents. These gameplay modes will allow you to apply our lessons without fear of negatively impacting other players, and will make you a more confident driver once you're ready to hit the track with hundreds of thousands of other iRacers from around the world. Ready to get started? Head to the next chapter for a discussion of vehicle dynamics. We'll see you on the track. In this section of the iRacing Driving School, we're going to discuss vehicle dynamics. Vehicle dynamics is a term used to describe how a car responds to the driver's control inputs. All cars respond to a driver's input following the laws of physics. The cars in the sim are designed to respond in the same way as real cars. Your ability to get a car around the racetrack is dependent on the capability of the car, but it's even more dependent on your ability to control the car. Having a good understanding of how to control a car, whether sim or real, is essential to being a good driver. Whether you're racing or simply driving to work, there are three basic control inputs or commands a driver can use to make a car perform. The gas pedal, along with the clutch and shifter pedal, make it go. The brake pedal makes it stop, and the steering wheel makes the car turn. Learning to effectively use the controls is the key to driving. In fact, it's even more important in the sim, as the feedback you get is drastically less in the sim than in a real car. You have no seat of the pants forces to tell you the result of your inputs in the sim, and you have to rely on visual and limited steering feedback to assess the effectiveness of your actions. Thus, the more knowledge the driver has, the more efficient they'll be in controlling the sim car. All of the commands you give the car with these controls are transmitted into action via the tires. Understanding how the tires work is the first step. The engineers at iRacing have been very careful to accurately replicate the way that real tires behave in the simulation. There are three directional forces. The tire is subject to acceleration, braking, and turning. The tire's grip can be devoted to any one or combination of these forces. To accomplish a driver's command, a tire interacts with the surface of the track by distortion of the rubber moving over the surface, causing a small amount of slip. This slip, referred to as the slip angle while cornering, determines the effectiveness of the tires. Too much slip and you lose grip. Not enough and you're below the potential of the tires. In part two of vehicle dynamics, We'll take a look at how tire grip is influenced by load transfer in your car, and we'll show you some ways to practice what you've learned. Welcome to the second half of our discussion on vehicle dynamics. In this section, we're going to talk about driver control inputs and how those inputs affect the car's tires. We're also going to discuss load transfer in a car and the various issues that can occur because of it. In a real car, slip is felt via G-forces. As you approach the limit, the driver senses or feels what is happening. In the sim, tire noise provides the feedback as to what is happening, and this is how the sim driver determines how close they are to the limit of grip. Once the optimum slip angle is exceeded, the available grip falls off and the tire begins to slide. Unless more load is put in the tire, 
or the speed is reduced, the tire will not respond as desired. Aerodynamics, also known as aero, can help with loading by putting more downforce on the tires as the speed increases relative to the car's static weight. When you step on the accelerator, the weight of the car is shifted more toward the rear of the car. This puts more force on the rear tires, thereby providing more grip. When you brake, the opposite happens, and the load shifts toward the front of the car, putting more load on the front tires while cornering. You want the car balanced with an equal load on the front and rear. Creating an imbalance with abrupt pedal input will lead to understeer and oversteer. If, while cornering, there's too much addition of throttle, the car will understeer. If your response to the understeer is an abrupt lift of the throttle, something called trailing throttle oversteer, or TTO, is the result. While cornering, if the throttle is applied too abruptly and the car has enough horsepower, then oversteer is again the result. This is because the rear tires cannot handle both the cornering load and the acceleration load at the limit of the tire's grip during braking. If too much steering is added without releasing some brake pedal pressure, then understeer happens, as the front tires cannot do both jobs at the limit. When the brake pedal is released too quickly while initiating a turn, also known as trail braking, the car will tend to oversteer, as the front tires have most of the grip, causing the back end to get loose. Slow release of the brake, on the other hand, will produce predictable and manageable rotation that can be used to effectively pinpoint the car, thus giving you optimum grip through the turn. Remember, the best fix for understeer is a slight lift to the throttle. Do not add more steering. The best fix for oversteer is staying off the throttle and steering in the same direction as the slide, as well as being prepared for the second reaction slide by quickly steering back in the original direction. If you don't catch the slide and you continue to spin, be a good sport and lock up the brakes instantly so that the other drivers around you can better predict which way you'll be going. Using your eyes effectively is the real way to determine good car control. As most of your information in the sim is based on visual cues rather than feeling, looking in the right direction makes all the difference as we will be discussing in the Using Your Eyes video. Don't look where you think the car is going. Instead, look in the direction you want to go. Looking far enough ahead of the car will give you a better perspective and more time to make good decisions about what you want the car to do. To practice what you've learned, spend some time on our skid pad, known as centripetal circuit, in each of the cars you'll be driving, experimenting with all of the situations that we've mentioned. Pay close attention to your inputs on the controls and the resulting reaction of the car with the lack of seat of the pants feel on the sim. You really need to think about and plan for what you want the car to do. Also, focus on where you're looking and if it is far enough ahead of the car. If everything feels too fast and you're having a hard time catching slides, make a conscious effort to look further ahead and in the direction you want the car to go. Welcome back to the iRacing Driving School. Our next unit will cover fundamentals of the racing line and cornering. Every racing circuit that you encounter, both in iRacing and in real life, will be comprised of a series of straightaways linked by a series of corners. I mean, it makes sense, right? You've got to turn at some point. Your job as a driver is to make use of all the available pavement within the defined track limits to find the optimal path or line. You want a line that allows you to optimize the car's handling abilities and carry maximum speed through every corner and onto every straight. The rewards for mastering the line in conjunction with your other driving skill sets are faster lap times and hopefully race wins. Also, keep in mind that whether you're racing on an oval or a road course, these basic principles still hold true. We're now going to take a closer look at how to find the best racing line, as well as the proper techniques for cornering, although you will find that not all corners are created equal. Let's take a moment to discuss some terminology that we'll be using to break down a corner. First is turn in, for the initial point on the track at which the driver turns the steering wheel to guide the car into the corner. The turning point varies from corner to corner, 
but it's vital because it adjusts the trajectory of the car to guide it to the next important target. Next is the apex. The apex is the term used for the inside edge or bottom of the corner that you're negotiating. The apex is the heart of the racing line and accuracy is important. You want to be within inches of the apex of each corner on every lap. The final portion of the corner is the track out for the last possible piece of asphalt at the edge of the track as you exit the corner. This is the easy part because if you've executed the turn in and apex correctly, the car will naturally want to travel to the track out. The reason that these three terms are so important is because when driving through a corner, if we accurately place the vehicle next to each of these three points, we will be traveling on the largest possible radius through that corner. This is vital because the larger the radius, the higher the speed that we can carry through a given corner. Let's clarify the radius equals speed equation in basic terms. If you were to take a car onto a large open parcel of pavement, turn the steering wheel a quarter of a turn, or 45 degrees, and start driving on that constant radius, you would eventually reach a maximum speed, based on the grip available from the tires on that vehicle holding on that same radius. Any efforts to increase your speed would either create understeer or oversteer, most likely understeer, as the increased lateral forces cause the vehicle to overstep its grip threshold. Now, if you were to reduce your steering angle by as little as 5 or 10 degrees, changing trajectory to a larger radius, you would note that the vehicle would be able to travel at a higher speed. This is the principle that we have to apply at every corner. It's important to use all available pavement within the defined path of the racetrack to create the largest possible radius for maximum speed through the corner. You'll note in this diagram that three separate radii have been outlined. The first and most common misconception is that the fastest route through a given corner is the shortest route, meaning hugging the corner. Although that minimizes the amount of real estate that has to be covered, you can see that it forces the vehicle to travel on the smallest radius, and thus at the limit, carrying the lowest speed through the corner. Another radius, as you can see, would be to drive the vehicle around the outside of the corner. While this does give you a larger radius and more speed, it is, again, not the optimum method for getting around the corner. Now, if we apply our turn in, apex, track out model, you'll see that the radius created is simply more efficient than the other two. A higher rate of speed is carried through the corner and our track out speed is optimal, showing all three lines taken at the same time. You'll see that finding the right turn in, apex, and track out is the fastest way to get through the corner. One last important note. Sometimes, instead of grass or gravel, there will be additional pavement in the runoff areas that are beyond the white lines that indicate the track limits. While it may be tempting to use this extra space to create an even wider radius, and you've probably even seen some pro drivers do it before, think of it here like stepping out of bounds in any other sport. Those out of bounds surfaces may not change either, but they still aren't in play. If you leave the track limits, the sim may not count your lap time, so make sure to check the track rules if you have any questions. Next, we're going to discuss different corner types. As you gain experience as a driver, you're going to be challenged by a variety of different tracks and thus a variety of corners. There are certain types of corners that you'll encounter again and again, so we're going to define them so you can retain them in your inventory of racing terminology and important things to know. As you explore new tracks in iRacing, one of the more common corners that you'll encounter is a constant radius corner, named so because throughout the corner its radius never changes. For examples of this type of corner, take a look at Laguna Seca, which has several 90 degree corners to choose from. You can see from this overhead visual that the car gets to a definitive point at the end of the braking zone and adjusts trajectory at the turn-in beginning the radius through the corner. If the turn-in is executed properly, you should be right on target for the apex here and then onto the track out here. As you can see, we've created the largest constant radius possible. That means speed. 
With an increasing radius corner, the radius changes throughout the corner, starting small and growing at the exit of the corner. This type of corner tends to be a lot of fun from a driving standpoint, because you can turn in a little early and pick up an early apex, but you still end up with plenty of pavement on the exit of the corner as you're tracking out. This can mean big speed and big fun, depending on the size of the corner. The decreasing radius corner is a tough one to master. As its name implies, it is a corner that begins with a large radius that gets progressively smaller throughout. A classic example of a decreasing radius corner is turns 1 and 2 at Lime Rock Park. Although this is by name two corners, it's almost treated as one. The trick here is that the initial radius of the corner will allow you to carry large amounts of speed. But as you get into the turn and the radius begins to shrink, you must slow the vehicle down in order to meet the grip threshold of the smaller radius. Notice how the vehicle can carry a lot of speed into the first part of the corner. But as the radius decreases, notice that there needs to be a speed adjustment at the halfway point in order to get through the smaller radius of turn two. The primary reason this type of corner is so difficult is because you have to slow down mid-corner, which disrupts the balance of the car and can cause either understeer or oversteer depending upon the vehicle being driven and your driving techniques. Your average 180 degree hairpin turn can be a unique challenge and can be handled in a variety of ways depending on your driving style or the type of car that you're driving. On the face of it, it would appear that simply turning in and apexing in the middle of the corner would be the most efficient way to handle this type of corner, particularly if you're dealing with a fairly small radius. However, it doesn't necessarily give you the optimal exit speed. Another option for negotiating a hairpin is to treat it like two separate corners, with apexes at one quarter and three quarters distance around the turn. You enter the corner and pass the first apex, run wide in the middle of the corner, and rotate the car to aim it towards the second apex and onto the exit. This is particularly effective if the corner has a relatively large radius and the car that you're driving is pretty nimble and has good power to accelerate quickly. But the third option, and most common approach, is to simply treat the hairpin like a late apex corner at the end of the braking zone. You'll turn in very late and aim for an apex that is about three quarters of the way around the corner. This allows you to get back to power early and optimize your exit speed. However, you do have to be careful about using this method in traffic. Your slower entry speed will certainly make you susceptible to being passed by a competitor. Next, we're going to categorize the types of corners and see how all of this looks once you put it together. So far in this section of the iRacing Driving School, we've learned how to find the right racing line by locating the turn in, apex, and track out, as well as how to handle the various corners you can encounter on a given track. Now, we'll take a look at the types of corners found at tracks all over the world, and we'll put everything we've learned together. A Type 1 corner is one that leads onto a long straight. These corners are critical because you need to make every effort to achieve the highest possible exit speed in order to carry that speed down the straight. There's no better way to gain speed than when the car is traveling in a straight line and the gas pedal is on the floor. The last corner at Lime Rock Park is a great example and a good one to practice. It's a classic constant radius corner followed by a long straight. Type 2 corners are found at the end of long straights. Regardless of the radius of these corners, it is vital to consider the amount of time that you have the accelerator fully depressed on the straight. Traditionally, exit speed on Type 2 corners is not as vital as is focusing on optimizing your braking and carrying speed into the corner. Turn 1 at Lime Rock Park is a great example, particularly because past the apex, you're going to need to reduce your speed to make it through the tighter radius of Turn 2. This turn is a great location to work on your late braking all the way to the apex of the corner. Sometimes called a compromise corner, a Type 3 corner is basically a corner that leads into another corner. A great example of this is Turns 3 and 4, or the left-hander and right-hander, also at Lime Rock Park. Because you have two interconnected turns, you're unable to optimize the radius of both. 
so you sacrifice the optimum line through the first corner in order to be on the best possible radius for the second corner, because turn four at Lime Rock Park leads onto a straightaway. We choose a line through turn three where its only purpose is to set us up for the ideal entrance into turn four. Additionally, if you want to really challenge yourself, check out the double compromise corners of Summit Point in turn seven and eight. For additional practice, try using the active reset feature, which allows you to drive a specific section of track over and over again with the hit of a button. In order to map the active reset controls, navigate to the controls tab in the options menu. Map active reset save start point and active reset run to two separate buttons. Head out on track to the corner you would like to practice and press the button map to active reset save start point before the corner. Then press the button map to active reset run after exiting the corner. After your first reset, your delta time between the start and end points will be displayed. This is a great tool to see how running different lines will affect your lap time. For more information on using active reset, watch our related iRacing how-to tutorial linked in this video's description. With what you've learned about the race line and cornering, it's important to put it all together and make it useful on the track. Like learning any skill, getting a feel for the racing line is going to take time and practice. That said, you should have a process in place to learn new circuits and new corners that'll help you to ramp up your learning curve relatively quickly. First, when tackling a new track, try to be methodical in your approach. Start slowly, pick up reference points along the track, and get a feel for the terrain for the first couple of laps. For each corner, start with a late turn in and a late apex, leaving you with a lot of room at the exit of the corner. As you become more comfortable, gradually turn in an apex earlier until your track out point is right at the edge of the pavement. This will indicate that you're right on line, as you won't have a coach sitting next to you every time you drive. Another important aspect to your training is learning how to identify your mistakes. A symptom that you've turned in too early is that you'll need to turn the steering wheel more after the apex. If you're doing this, try turning in later and keep the steering wheel steady all the way to track out. Although we've talked about taking a late apex as part of the process of learning a track, it's certainly not the quickest way around. It's harder to identify when you're turning too late. Your general impression will be that the corner seems too easy after the apex. If you're not a little worried that you might go wide at the exit, you may be turning in too late. Try turning in a little earlier until your exit speed is maximized. Remember, as you're exiting a corner, you want to allow the car to travel right to the edge of the racing surface. As you can see, learning the art of the racing line isn't exactly black and white. There are rules that apply to one track that might not apply to another. Yet there's no question that practice and experience will pay dividends in the long run. Cultivating and mastering this skill set will help you to quickly learn new tracks and outsmart your competitors. Good luck! In this section of the iRacing Driving School, we're going to talk about using your eyes. Of all the things to remember on the racetrack, perhaps the one that can be the toughest to keep in mind is just how important it is to use your eyes correctly when driving on track at speed. In fact, using your eyes can be critical to your success as well as your safety. In this lesson, you'll hear about the importance of looking forward, finding visual cues along the racetrack, how to use your eyes in traffic, and making adjustments for the sim. You may have heard someone say, look where you want the car to go. It makes sense, but in reality, it's a bit more complex than that. You need to look ahead, far ahead. Perhaps because we spend so much time driving on public roads at lower speeds or in traffic, we tend to look at the road directly in front of the car or maybe at the rear bumper of the car ahead. On the racetrack, if we apply that same focal length when we drive at speed, we get into trouble. The track will be rushing at us so quickly that reference points can't be processed and we become reactive as drivers. The further ahead you look, the slower your environment seems to be moving. This gives your brain more time to process information, allowing you to pick up your reference points early and anticipate your next move. One thing that you'll likely notice is that you'll make fewer reactionary steering inputs, and overall, your driving will be considerably more fluid. 
looking ahead is especially important in a sim because there aren't any physical forces or G's acting upon your body. You have to process a tremendous amount of data about what the car is doing through visual cues. When you're on track in the sim, always look to the next corner. Once you've committed to the corner that you're in, get your eyes up to your next target. A great place to practice this is at the Laguna Seca Corkscrew. This track features a series of closely connected technical corners, some elevation changes, and a corner exit that's tough to see. As you drive through this segment of the track, once you hit the apex of a corner, force yourself to look ahead to your next turn in and apex. Remember, always focus on what's coming next. Don't just look at the pavement that's right in front of you. Widen your sight. Picture and take in everything that's available as a reference point. Guardrails, buildings, trees, and terrain are all good for this. Having spatial awareness allows you to focus on another important skill, driving in traffic. As you know, there are some natural tendencies from street driving that we sometimes bring to the track. It's very easy to get caught up in what the driver in front of you is doing, and thereby losing concentration on your own line and your own race. You have to do your best to resist this. Look beyond the car in front of you to pick up your reference points for braking and turning. If you don't, you run the risk of copying what your competitor is doing. Mistakes and all. Not to mention, you'll never go faster than they are. You need to be prepared to turn their mistakes into your opportunities. Using your eyes in the sim presents a different set of challenges than you would experience in an actual race car. Because the screen is your strongest connection to the track, all of the driving experience is being absorbed through your eyes. In addition, because many of you are likely working with a flat screen monitor, there's no peripheral vision. To some extent, you're going to have to fill in the blanks mentally to complete the field of vision around you without the movement of a real car. You don't feel the lateral and longitudinal forces pushing on your body to give you the sensation of how fast you're going or how much you're slowing down. So in addition to all the visual cues, you have to remember to stay online. You also have to visualize, rather than feel, oversteer or understeer situations and react to them quickly. It does take some time to get comfortable with using the cues, but with experience, you'll note variances in screen motion. That will be an indication that you need to make an input adjustment with the wheel or the pedals. Though we hope you enjoy practicing and racing with iRacing as much as possible, Looking at a monitor for hours on end can be hard on the eyes when you add in all the things you've got to remember while driving. With the level of concentration it takes to keep your car online and going fast, well, it can be downright brutal. With that said, be sure and pay close attention to the setup of your system, whether setting up on a desktop, chassis, or TV. Put the monitor in a place that does not cause strain or is too far away or too high. Also, adjust the brightness, color, and frame rate of your monitor to ensure comfort. Something else to consider is that in real world driving, racers use the straights to relax, breathe, and stretch out a bit. This can be the same in the sim, and a perfect time to relax your eyes too. When you get onto a straight, relax the tension in your arms and hands as well as your eyes. Take a moment to focus your eyes on some other objects that are in the immediate vicinity. Your eyes are perhaps your most valuable assets on the racetrack. In racing, using your eyes can help you to anticipate situations to your advantage and hopefully lead to better performance on the track. Welcome back to the iRacing Driving School. Our next topic is braking. Braking is one of the most difficult skills to master in both the sim and real cars, and it's one of the most important. There are several different types of brake pedal applications for different specific purposes. Investing time on developing better braking skills will have benefits, not only in lower lap times, but also in better race results. Being able to brake as late as possible, or as little as possible before a corner, allows you to maintain the highest possible speed for the greatest duration of time. Let's take a look at how to get this done. Threshold braking refers to braking at the limit of the tire's ability to grip the track surface. This means the driver can brake very late at the end of a long straightaway. Turn 11 at Laguna Seca is a classic example of a threshold braking corner. Braking at the threshold of lockup 
ensures that you're getting the most possible grip from the tires. Once the tires are locked, the efficiency of the braking goes away as the tire melts and abrades on the pavement. By keeping the tire rolling just slightly slower than the car is traveling, the maximum grip is developed at the contact patch. Of course, not all braking situations require threshold braking. Many times, an earlier softer brake pedal or brush brake is all that's needed. For instance, turn six at Laguna Seca is just such a brake application for many cars. Many ovals require a similar technique referred to as brake turning. This is where a slight turn is initiated during the braking application and a balance between braking and cornering is maintained. If you're at 100% braking, there's no grip available for turning. If steering is added while at threshold, the tire will lock up unless some of the braking force is released. This leads to trail braking, where slight rotation or pointing of the car upon release of the brake pedal at turn-in can be very useful. Mastering the various braking techniques is tricky enough in a real car. Take away the physical sensations of movement and the job becomes even harder to master in the sim. In a real car, the braking systems are all pressure-based. The harder you push, the more resistance. But only the best sim controls have this kind of setup. Most of the affordable pedal systems for the sim are position-based, meaning you need to learn where in the pedal travel threshold braking occurs, whether you use your left foot or right foot on the brake. There are some clues you can look for to see how close you are to threshold. In any of the open wheel cars, you have the luxury of being able to see the tire rotation. The Ray FF1600 is the easiest to start with because of the tread pattern of the tire. The next most obvious clue is the tire noise. There are subtle differences in the way the tires make noise as they get closer to the threshold. Each kind of tire will have a different sound, and headphones might be a better way than speakers to hear the differences. Steering feedback is another way to tell if threshold has been exceeded. Once the tires lock, the steering has no effect. If you have force feedback on your wheel, you'll feel the steering get vague, and if you turn the wheel, there will be little, if any, direction change. In any of the closed wheel cars, you'll have to rely on the sound of the steering to tell if you've exceeded threshold. The Toyota GR86 has ABS, or anti-lock brakes. Therefore, it's a car where you can push the brake pedal as hard as you wish, and there will be no lockup. Be sure to take a look at part two of the iRacing Driving School braking exercise, where we'll discuss the concepts of brake bias, braking points, and some exercises you can do in practice to master these techniques. Hello, and welcome to part two of our discussion on braking in the iRacing Driving School. In this section, we're going to take what we've learned about braking techniques and discuss, in greater detail, how to apply them, where to apply them, and some great ways to practice these techniques in a non-racing situation. As we discussed in the vehicle dynamics video, you have to think about the transfer of weight under a braking situation. When you apply the brake, the weight of the car transfers towards the front tires. This means the front tires have more grip than the rear. This transfer of weight is why braking systems have something called brake bias. Brake bias is the difference in pedal pressure distributed to the front and rear wheels and helps to compensate for this loading difference. It can be adjusted when setting up a car for a particular track. Too much front bias and the front tires lock before the rear tires do. Too much rear bias and just the opposite will occur. The faster a car is traveling, the harder the brake pedal can be pushed before the tires lock up. In most race cars, this is primarily because at faster speeds, there is aerodynamic downforce that increases the tire's grip, and as the car slows, that downforce, or grip, lessens. This means that it's easier to get the brakes to lock the slower the car is going. Therefore, the initial application is very important. You want to take off as much speed as early in the brake zone as possible, so as you get closer to the turning point, you're able to modulate off the pressure. Modulation is also necessary if you lock the tire at any time during the braking application. Try to get the tire rolling as soon as possible 
with as little release of pedal pressure as you can manage. Regardless of what kind of braking you're doing, start with a conservative early brake point. There are few mistakes harder to fix than a brake point left too late. Establish what level of braking is available and then work the brake point closer to the turn in. If you're threshold braking, when you reach the point where it's difficult to make it to the apex, you know you've gone far enough. If you're braking and turning at the same time, experiment with subtle changes in brake levels to see the effect on how well the car turns in. For brush braking situations, try lighter pressure or shorter duration and observe the results. If you're trail braking, experiment with the rate at which you release the brake pedal and observe the different rates of rotation. A good way to hone the braking skills we've discussed is to start with straight line threshold braking. Pick the Ray FF1600 car, go to Lime Rock, and stop the car on the front straight before the start finish line. Accelerate and hold the speed at 6000 RPM. Start braking at the six board and see how quickly you can bring the car to a stop. You should be able to stop it just before the four board. Notice the different level of tire noise between lockup and no lockup. Be sure to practice this many times. Instead of taking a whole lap to get back to the starting point, you can also use our active reset function to restart from the sector that you'd like. For another practice session, select either the FF1600 or the late model stock and go to a small oval track like Lanier. Here, work on brake turning skills and experiment with different levels of brake and steering input. Next, try a great trail braking corner like Turn 2 at Laguna Seca. Again, experiment with different rates of pedal release while in the car and observe the effects. If there's no rotation, you need more turn-in speed. Finally, experiment with changing the brake bias for all of the situations we've mentioned and notice the effects. With a little practice and concentration on your braking techniques, you should see an improvement in your performance in braking zones and corners. Ultimately, this will result in smoother sailing on the track and, of course, faster lap times. Good luck out there! Hello, and welcome back to the iRacing Driving School. In this section, we'll discuss downshifting your car, how to shift, when to shift, and when not to shift. First things first, why bother shifting? What is the reason for using gears in a race car? Well, all engines have an optimum range of revolutions per minute, or RPMs, where they make the most power. If you can use gear ratios to keep the engine at or near that optimum power band, then you'll be maximizing the acceleration capabilities of the car at all times. Shifting between the gears then becomes a task that needs to match the optimum engine revs to the relative speed of the car, as dictated by the track and the corners. On oval tracks, the gear selection should be such that the maximum revs are reached just as you arrive to the next corner. On the road courses, you want to avoid shifting up or down in a corner and leave the shifting for the straights. In a fixed ratio gearbox car, this means there may be some compromise on gear selection. If you can make the higher gear work, use it. You should never limit your speed in a corner due to hitting the rev limit at the engine. Many of the cars in the sim have adjustable gear ratios. This means you can set up the gearbox so the shift points are at the best locations around the racetrack. If you can, set the gears so that the red line for maximum revs is reached just after track out in the most important corners. For some of the cars, the final drive ratio is all that can be changed, so the relative ratio between all the gears is adjusted appropriately. It is perhaps a misconception that downshifting is a method of reducing speed only in extremely rare circumstances. Is this true? The purpose of the downshift is to select the optimum gear for the corner or track situation. The brakes are much better suited to slow the car down. The selection of this lower gear just so happens to be easiest to do while well in the brake zone, and is perhaps the origin of this confusion. Way back in the early days of racing, the downshift was actually used to help slow the car. But ever since the advent of disc brakes, there's just no need to do it now. So remember, use your brakes. In a real car, the task of proper heel and toe downshifting is one of the most difficult skills to master, especially if the gearbox requires double clutching. But in the sim, you'll probably start with the auto clutch and blip feature. To do a real downshift properly, you must first establish your brake application point and level. 
Then, while continuing to brake, begin your downshifts. While downshifting, raise the engine revs with a brief blip of the throttle without releasing brake pressure so the engine speed and wheel speed match. This is what is commonly referred to as the heel and toe technique. You'll need to keep the ball of your right foot on the brake pedal while either moving the heel of your foot to the accelerator pedal or rolling your foot to simultaneously blip the throttle. Meanwhile, your left foot is free to operate the clutch. Do this for each downshift. If you don't blip the throttle high enough, you might find yourself with a sudden increase in rear brake bias as the rear tires break loose from the load of the idling engine. A good baseline of when to actually do the shift is to apply a halfway rule. Halfway from the brake application to your turn-in point, do the first downshift. Halfway from that downshift to turn in, do the second downshift. And so on for as many downshifts as needed. If you really want to raise your game, and you have the controls that allow it, use the appropriate shifting control for the car you're driving. For example, the Ray FF1600, Ford Mustang FR500S, and Lotus 79 are all H-pattern cars. The Global MX-5 Cup car, Toyota GR86, and NASCAR Next Gen Cup Series cars are all sequential shift. Using the correct shifting control will further simulate the job the driver has to do in the real car. For many of the racers who use iRacing as training for real driving, this is an essential part of the realism. Taking a little time to learn the proper technique for downshifting will help you maximize your car's power through turns and make a positive impact on your lap times and race results. Welcome back to the iRacing Driving School. Once you've mastered all the skill sets involved with driving the car, it's time to get down to the business of racing the car. The skill of truly knowing how to race is most commonly known as racecraft. It's the ability to assess your competitors on track, analyze and seize opportunities to pass other drivers, defend your position, control your emotions, and have a strong sense of awareness about what's happening around you when you're in the heat of battle. Each of these skills plays an important part in your success on the track. So let's go racing! Before we delve into the intricacies of passing other cars, there is one rule that must be followed in all forms of motorsport. This is the big one. No matter what series, track, or car that you're driving, it is the responsibility of the overtaking driver, meaning the car that is attempting to execute the pass, to make sure that the pass is made cleanly and incident-free. Previously, we've talked about the importance of driving your own race and your own line, rather than that of the car immediately in front of you. Consider this, if you're following another competitor, you'll be going exactly the same speed as they are, which is hardly the optimum scenario for executing a pass. Experience will allow you to evaluate if you're faster than your competitor in one corner or another. Hopefully, one of those corners where your performance is superior will lead on to a straightaway that provides ample room to execute a pass. The discipline needed to execute a corner exit pass is to allow a gap to your rival so that you can get a run on them and convert your extra cornering speed to additional miles per hour down the straight. The trick, though, is timing. You want to position yourself so that you can execute the pass just beyond the track out point of the corner. If you leave too little of a gap, you could very well find yourself under the gearbox or rear bumper of your competitor at the apex of the corner, thus creating contact and possibly a spin. If you have to lift out of the throttle mid-corner, or if you leave too much of a gap going into the corner, there's a chance that you might not be able to catch alongside and pass your competitor on the ensuing straight. Certainly, practice and experience will improve your ability to judge exactly how much space you should leave for a given corner or competitor. Additionally, for situations where the closing rate is particularly high, it may be beneficial to aim for a slightly later apex, so that once you're exiting the corner, you have some available grip should you need to adjust your line prior to corner exit. In the next section on racecraft, we'll go over passing techniques, etiquette, and awareness on the racetrack. Welcome back to the iRacing Driving School we're going to continue our discussion on racecraft and passing. Let's talk technique. We'll start with aerodynamic drag. What is it? Aerodynamic drag is a force that acts upon race cars at all times when they're in motion. Additionally, as speed increases, 
arrow drag increases quadratically, meaning that as speed doubles, the arrow drag increases four times, using up more of the engine's horsepower to overcome this resistance. Aero drag comes into play in passing because a car traveling at speed will create a hole in the air, leaving in its wake an area of lower resistance that can be to the benefit of the car behind it. This is commonly referred to as drafting. The execution of a pass by drafting is fairly straightforward. It's necessary to leave a slight gap to the competitor that you're trailing. Once on a straightaway, that gap, along with the vacuum created by the car ahead, will allow you to accelerate to a speed that may be three or four miles per hour faster than would normally be possible. You'll use that momentum as you pull out of the draft to go around the car ahead. Though the mechanics of this type of pass are pretty straightforward, there are a few other variables that you need to consider to consistently execute a safe pass. The first is closing rate. As you're running in the draft, you know that you're going to be accelerating and closing up on the car in front of you so it should be fairly easy to judge the correct time to pull out of the draft to execute the pass. However, keep in mind that as you get closer to your competitor, you'll be reducing the amount of turbulence behind their car, thus momentarily creating a situation where they will also have a slight aerodynamic benefit as you pull out of the draft. That turbulence will come back into play, causing their car to accelerate less quickly, which will increase the closing rate briefly as you begin your execution of the pass. Keep this variable in mind so that you don't clip a front wheel or fender as you make your way around the other car. The other variable that you have to contend with when executing this type of pass is how to get back on the racing line. In a perfect world, when you execute a pass by drafting, you'll have enough momentum to be able to pull back in line in front of your competitor prior to the breaking point for the next corner. But because your speed advantage will gradually deteriorate once you're out of the draft, you need to focus on your spatial awareness to keep track of your competitor to determine when, or if, you can get back online. Additionally, it's also important to note that there's some benefit to allowing a driver that is passing you back in line. If you hold position and both of you reach the next corner side by side, you'll both be subjected to lower cornering speeds because the passing driver is offline. Unfortunately, there are never any guarantees that either the corner exit pass or drafting techniques will allow you to fully pass a competitor on the straight. It's far more likely that you'll end up executing a pass in the braking zone at the end of a long straightaway. The braking zone pass can be executed in the following manner. First, position yourself next to your competitor as you reach the braking point. Secondly, as you approach your traditional turn-in point, keep in mind that you're going to have to turn in slightly later because you're a car width or more offline going into the corner. This also allows you to brake slightly deeper than your competitor because your turn in target is slightly later. Turning in, you should find yourself on the correct line and aim towards the traditional apex. Then, be ready to get on the throttle. But keep in mind that you should be aware of where your competitor is located on the track. It's not unlikely that they may have tried to stay with you on the outside of the corner and may be between you and your track out point. That takes care of passing techniques. Next, we'll go over important information about etiquette, defensive driving, and awareness on the racetrack. In this third and final section on racecraft and passing, we're going to talk about etiquette, defensive driving, and general awareness on the racetrack. This is vital information in regard to racecraft, as it puts together everything we've discussed and separates the pros from the weekend drivers. Want to start a heated off-track debate? All you have to do is start a discussion about who has the rights to a particular corner as two cars enter it, the overtaking driver or the driver being overtaken. While there will always be differing opinions, adhering to the following guidelines should clear up most disagreements when it comes to road course racing. First, if an overtaking car is fully alongside a competitor, meaning wheel to wheel at the braking point, the corner goes to the overtaking car. In this case, it is the obligation of the car that is being passed to surrender the corner and not turn into their competitor. Next, if for any reason the overtaking driver is not fully alongside of the driver being passed at the turn-in point, the corner does not belong to the driver who is attempting to overtake. In this case, it is the obligation of the potentially overtaking driver to give the other competitor room and do everything possible not to create an incident. For oval track racing, the general guideline is that the driver being passed should not come down on the passer if contact is likely, 
regardless of how far alongside the passer is. Another form of racing where etiquette is especially important is multi-class racing. In this type of road racing, multiple classes of cars, which usually run very different lap times, share the track in a single combined session. The general guideline here is that drivers in the faster classes are responsible for finding a safe place to pass the drivers in the slower class. Drivers in the slower class, meanwhile, are responsible for maintaining a consistent line to make this easier for the faster class drivers. Note that blue flags are advisory only in iRacing, so be aware of your surroundings and be courteous to other drivers. Although we've defined a few specific techniques to execute a pass, keep in mind that your opportunities to do so may not always be so neat and tidy. The reality is that once the green flag waves, you'll need to be flexible and try to seize every chance you can to get by a competitor. Whether it happens by your own execution or by taking advantage of their mistake, make the pass safely and cleanly. It goes without saying, of course, that if you have a lead over a competitor, you want to hold that lead. This example of strategic vehicle placement shows a car driving down a straight on the opposite side of the normal line, in order to force the trailing competitor to the outside line going into the next corner. This defensive line, while frustrating for the overtaking driver, is considered a reasonable strategy for defending your track position. This example of blocking shows a car driving down a straightaway using the mirrors to weave left and right, blocking any potential moves by its pursuer. This, above all else, is not considered good sportsmanship and will certainly draw the ire of your competitors. It's also against the iRacing Sporting Code, even if there are some racing series in the real world where you may have seen this go without a penalty. The difference between a defensive line and blocking is that in the first example, the lead car is holding its line, but giving the trailing car an opportunity to commit to a line of its own. In the second example, the lead car is repeatedly adjusting its line to impede the trailing car. We've talked before about the importance of spatial awareness when you're out on track, but as you're near other competitors during passing situations, it's even more important. As depth perception in a sim can be difficult, you need to be particularly aware as you overtake other cars. As an overtaking driver, make sure that you're cognizant of closing speeds, whether you're in the draft or simply approaching a slower driver. Additionally, we know that peripheral vision is limited in the sim, and as we're now adding other cars to the mix, it's easy to lose sight of our external reference points. This will be particularly apparent when you're drafting or when you have another competitor next to you in a braking zone. You'll need to pick up other cues, whether they be on the track surface or on the opposite side of the track. Regardless, train yourself to absorb as much data as possible so that you'll be able to make sound decisions about where your car is on the track and where you want it to be. In the sim, audio cues are helpful to ascertain what's going on around you as well. You'll be able to hear the engine noise of other competitors as they get close to you. Listen to variations in that engine noise and use that as a cue to check your mirrors and take note of those around you. Additionally, make use of the spotter feature to gather more data about what's happening around your car to help keep you out of trouble. Finally, consider using the mic feature to talk with your other competitors. Keep in mind that this should be courteous, professional communication. It's not meant to distract or instigate. The concepts of racecraft really bring together the entire driving experience. It's truly the melding of the technical side with strategy, etiquette, and awareness. As with everything in racing, perfecting racecraft takes time, patience, and practice. Good luck out there. Hello, and welcome back to the iRacing Driving School. There's probably no other time during a race that the likelihood of an incident between two or more cars is higher than at the start. With an entire field of cars, nose to tail and side by side, drivers pumped full of adrenaline, and a racetrack that's suddenly claustrophobic, anything can happen. Although a multitude of variables, many that are out of your control, can influence the outcome of your race, a calm, calculating demeanor, coupled with a healthy dose of flexibility, will certainly improve your odds of getting through more than just the first corner of the track. Your mental approach to a race start is vital. There are few people who could say that they're completely calm at the start of a race. 
To combat this natural tension, anything you can do to calm your mind and relax your body will help in the long run. Your mind needs to be able to focus, and your muscles need to be ready to act and react. To further prepare yourself, take an inventory of the situation first. Look at the qualifying grid and examine the other drivers around you. Are there drivers who you've raced with before? Have you been around them in practice? Are they reckless? Consistent? Do you know if they watch these videos too? Though you can't predict what might happen, this will help you get a feel for who you're going to be working with and who might be a candidate to create some problems for the field. Next, take a look at your position on the grid. Are you in the top five, mid-pack, or bringing up the rear? Are you in the inside lane or the outside lane? If you're mid-pack or further back in the field, you need to be prepared for the accordion effect as the field stacks up in turn one. Remember that you need to be conscious of what's going on a few rows in front of you, not just with the car immediately in front of you. Also, remember that you're going to be braking at a completely different point than you normally would. If you're in the front of the pack, it's going to be later because you're approaching the first turn slower than normal. If you're in the back of the pack, it's going to be earlier because of the massive traffic jam in front of you. Another variable that you have to contend with is which lane you're in. If you're on the inside lane, you'll have the preferred line once you reach turn one. You'll need to be prepared to defend your position from your competitors at your back whenever possible. Don't allow enough space between you and the edge of the track, whether that be grass or a wall, for another competitor to slip by you. But also keep in mind that you're going to be entering turn one on a radius that is less than optimal. You'll also have competitors outside of you, so be mindful when it comes to getting back on the throttle and trying to get to the appropriate track out point. Being a little too anxious with the throttle can create some oversteer that will spin you, or understeer that could push you wide into another competitor ending both of your races. On the other hand, if you're in the outside row, you have to contend with a few other variables first. Once you get into turn one, you're going to be on the outside of the corner, which means a less than favorable line as well as a very close proximity to the edge of the track. This leaves little room for error. Additionally, your competitors, who are in such close quarters on the inside of the corner, are going to have the propensity to push wide as they're trying to accelerate out of the corner. We can talk about the multitude of possibilities that you might encounter at the start of a race, but the reality is you have to take your knowledge of what might happen, develop a strategy, and then be prepared to be completely flexible with your plan. Above all, the most important thing to do is protect the car so that you can make it to turn two. Once you get there, forget about everything that happened when the green flag dropped and get on with the job at hand. In the next section, we'll talk about how to get down to business, as well as some different types of starts you might experience in different races here at iRacing. Welcome back to part two of our lesson on race starts. We're going to discuss how to navigate once you've made it through the most dangerous part of the start, turn one. But first, we're going to talk about some different kinds of starts you'll encounter. iRacing oval track events use rolling starts exclusively, and many other forms of racing use them as well. The procedure for the rolling start is fairly straightforward. After a predetermined number of pace laps, the field lines up, two by two, nose to tail, and approaches the starter stand on the front straight at a speed that is determined by the pole sitter. The green flag will fly shortly after the pace car dives into pit lane. Passing is only permitted on the outside prior to the start-finish line. One of the challenges for the rolling start is making sure that you choose your gears wisely so that you're in the heart of your car's power band. Most starts will be conducted in either second or third gear, so make sure you choose wisely. The standing start is exclusive to road racing events and is entirely different than a rolling start. The cars start on the grid just before the start-finish line in a staggered formation that has been determined either by qualifying or I-rating. When all cars are in place, a red light visible to all drivers will come on at a random interval between four and seven seconds. The red lights will go out and green lights will come on. At this point, the entire field accelerates from a standstill, jockeying for position to turn one and the race has begun. Passing is permitted as soon as the lights turn green so you don't need to wait until passing the start-finish line to make a move. Regardless of the type of start, once things are moving, don't forget about your tasks in the car. It's not unheard of for a driver to get so wrapped up in the excitement of the start that they forget to change gears, both up on the straightaway 
and down once they get to turn one, hitting the rev limiter for an extra second, or even worse, blowing up your engine, will certainly lose you some positions. We've talked about a few strategies for dealing with some of the variables that you might encounter, but once the green flag flies, all bets are off. Absolutely anything can happen, and you need to be ready. Above all, your spatial awareness and your ability to make sound decisions on the fly will help you make a successful race start. Smart moves can be made, and you might be able to pick up a few positions, but above all, stay out of trouble and protect your equipment. You have to keep in mind that there is a time to race, and there is also a time that you need to weigh your options and make the best decision so that you can make it to the end of the race. Often, you'll come across a competitor who simply isn't going to relinquish a position at the start at any cost. Sometimes it isn't a bad decision to settle things down, get in line, and start working on your race in a progressive manner. The overall goal of a race start is to get through it and settle into driving your race. You'll have plenty of time to do just that. Don't forget to keep in mind that at iRacing, incidents slow down your license advancement, whether you cause them or not. So good luck, and be safe out there. Welcome back to the iRacing Driving School. So now it's time to get on track, virtually that is. Deciding what kind of session you plan to run will influence what your goals should be. In any of the session formats, try to have some level of a disciplined approach. The iRacing Sim is so realistic in its engineering that it's hard to be fast at first. So just as in the real world, be patient, especially for those of you who have real track experience, as you won't have the seat of the pants feel that you're likely used to to help with what's happening. Learning to plan, getting a feel for your control inputs, understanding the car's response, and driving within your abilities are all skills that will serve you well in a real car, so use the sim to hone those skills. To learn a new car, or experiment with your driving technique, test sessions are best. Testing is also how you can try cars that you're not eligible to race online yet based on your license. Start with a slow pace, slower than you think. Remember, with limited physical feedback to tell you how fast you're moving, it's very easy to make the most common mistake, going too fast too soon. So take the time to learn the track and the car and build up progressively. If you're constantly losing control and spinning or going off the track, analyze your inputs and see what the problem might be. This is also a great time to try different setups on the car. You can pick from the iRacing baseline setup, try setups that have worked for other iRacers, or experiment with your own setup when doing your own changes. Try to do just one or two small adjustments at a time so you can see if there's a noticeable effect. Many changes won't be noticeable unless a car is near its limit, so be sure to drive the car hard after making changes. Remember, the car can't make a mistake, only you can. Once you've gotten comfortable enough with how the car you're driving works, you can set up a single player race. Our AI racing modes include a majority of our most popular cars and tracks, and here, your license level doesn't matter. You can set up a race however you'd like to get a feel for what it's like to share the track with other cars without worrying about wrecking another human. And if things go wrong, you can simply reset and restart. Spend enough time in the testing and AI sessions until you get good enough to string at least a dozen laps together without any mistakes and set some consistent times, ideally at least within two seconds of one another on a road course. From there, try an official practice session. Practice is the best official session to start with because it'll give you a chance to see how you stack up against other drivers in the same car. Here, your rating is not affected by practice session incidents. However, the sporting code is always in effect, so drive with respect around your fellow racers. Keep this same disciplined approach and have a plan for something you want to work on in each session. You might try following another driver if there's one in a session with you. You might learn a trick about the race line, or see the potential for entry speed and even learn where to go slow to maximize exit speed. If someone's posting a faster time than you, it's not because they paid their engine builder more. It's because they paid their dues behind the wheel. Once you get comfortable with practice, try a time attack. Pick a tracking car you know well and feel consistent with. This is what the time attack is all about. Stringing together a series of laps as close together and as fast as you can for as long as you can. The concentration to do this is much harder than one hot lap. Improving your concentration level is very valuable and you'll need it for racing as well. Remember, 
how well or poorly you do in a time attack does influence your driver ratings, so drive with just a little more reserve and control than you might in testing or practice. Qualifying is where you need to put down your best single lap to get the best spot you can in the race start. For anyone who's ever watched qualifying on TV, you can quickly figure out the strategy for ovals. You only get a couple laps to make it happen with little or no warm-up. On the road courses, there's a determined session length and you only need one fast lap. Remember, if you make a significant mistake during a qualifying lap, that lap's probably no good, so slow down and regroup. Be sure to get as good a run off the last corner as you can to start the new lap as fast as possible. After that is the race and, well, you know the rest. Hello, and welcome back to the iRacing Driving School. For most of the iRacing Driving School, we've spent our time talking about how to drive in ideal conditions. But what about when the weather isn't perfect? You may have noticed that different track conditions can affect your experience. For example, a hotter track and a cooler track will afford you different levels of grip. But driving in the rain is its own skill set. It rewards patient and deliberate drivers who know how to adapt to changing conditions and maintain control at all times. Here, we're going to talk about how to both survive and make the most of a wet race. Here on iRacing, rain is possible in all series that have cars with rain tires, except for rookie series. But only specific cars and tracks on iRacing are enabled for rain racing. And for rain to show up in your session, both must be rain ready. To see the latest list of content that's rain ready, visit iRacing.com weather. When you load into a session, be sure to check the radar and forecast and plan accordingly before you get into the car. If your session is long enough to go from dry to wet, or vice versa, you'll want to take note beforehand. The forecast will be consistent from session to session on any given week in an official series, but that doesn't mean that rain will happen at the same time in each race, if it happens at all. The good news is that your crew chief and spotter will keep tabs on the weather and competition, so make sure to listen to your radio all race long. Rain should clear up soon. Many cars have adjustable brake bias settings that you can tweak. Moving your brake bias to the rear will help with front lock under braking and prevent you from sliding off track. Generally, the heavier the rain, the more you want to send your brake bias to the back of the car. Also, if your car has specific anti-lock brake or traction control settings for wet weather, be sure to use these as well. Once you get onto a wet track, one of the most important things to keep in mind is that the ideal driving line will change from what it is in the dry. The ideal dry line gets rubber buildup over time from cars driving on it. So when it's wet, that surface will be more slick. You'll want to try different lines around the track to search for maximum grip. Likewise, avoid other more slippery surfaces like painted lines, curbs, and especially puddles. They've also got even less grip in the rain. You'll also have to pay even more attention than usual to the cars around you, as a wet track makes mistakes easier to make for everyone. Other drivers who don't adapt their driving lines as quickly to the different weather, or who are stuck out in the rain on dry tires, can be perilous. Remember, our incident point system remains the same in the rain, so drive carefully. Wet weather racing is an art form to those who master it, but if you build on the good habits of patience and flexibility that you've learned from previous lessons, you should find yourself comfortable racing in the rain in no time. Good luck! The iRacing Driving School has taken you through every facet of iRacing, from the very basics of learning the car to how to get going in the race itself. But now that you've learned all this stuff, let's talk about where you're going to apply it. You'll be met by many multiplayer and single player racing options. The heart of iRacing is its official multiplayer series and license system. You'll start with a rookie license in five different disciplines of racing, oval, sports car, formula car, dirt oval, and dirt road. As you compete in each of these disciplines, your performance will affect two scores, I rating a score calculated based on your finishes relative to the skill of your competition, and safety rating, a score based on how well you avoid incidents and other mistakes. If you apply the lessons you've learned so far, you should have no problem increasing both. But each of these five disciplines operate with separate licenses, so your finishes in one won't affect another. To earn a higher official license, you need to meet a minimum participation requirement or MPR, and have a high enough safety rating to secure a promotion. Series that allow you to fulfill your MPR are noted with a green MPR icon in the iRacing UI. The MPR to get out of the rookie class is either two races 
or four completed time trials, and the minimum safety rating to receive a promotion is a 3.00 out of 5. Completing your rookie requirements in a license will promote you to D-Class right away. Most promotions are given at the end of official seasons, which lasts 12 weeks apiece. But very safe drivers who get their safety rating up to a 4.00 will be promoted immediately. However, you can be demoted too. A safety rating under 2.00 will be demoted after the season, and an SR under 1.00 will be demoted immediately. So be smart out there. If official racing isn't for you, iRacing has many other options to get out on track and apply the concepts you've learned here. Single player is straightforward. You can either set up an AI race or season with cars and tracks of your choosing, or you can enter a time attack and see how your hot laps stack up against the world. Other multiplayer options include hosted and league races. A hosted race is a single event that an iRacer is set up for other racers to join, while leagues put on organized series of hosted events for select communities of iRacers. Racing against other people all around the world in real time is just part of what makes iRacing so great. The ability to learn and practice from the comfort of your own home is another aspect that sets us apart. The iRacing Driving School offers instruction and racing concepts that will help you to become a more skilled, safe, and fast driver. We hope you take advantage of the information available to you by revisiting it as often as you like. In addition, be sure to hone your skills in practice sessions. Working through new concepts and skills on a variety of tracks and skid pads with a variety of cars will help you to be prepared in any racing situation. Remember, because this is a sim, your practice time is unlimited. As you begin to work through these new skills, take it slow at first, but don't be afraid to make mistakes. Work up to faster speeds as you become more comfortable. We hope that you find the iRacing Driving School to be a helpful tool. Good luck out there.